We welcome you in to another episode of Inside Boxing Live. It's Dan Canobio. It's the former world champion, Chris Algieri, the fighting collegian. Chris, fight season is upon us. I'm declaring this fight season. A slow two weeks gives way to a loaded six weeks. That's how I think. How are you, my friend? I'm good. First of all, I don't think it was I mean that slow, but if we only have two slow weeks in the year, I'm, I'll take it. So we've had a we've had a great year. So last year we had about eight slow months. Now, right. uh, doing myth- boxing, boxing, looking, boxing is looking good. I'm doing- boxing season. I'm with it. I like it. Yeah, we were doing MythBusters episodes last year, talking about <laughs> dipping your balls in ice. This past uh-huh. weekend, I was watching Razor Ruddick versus James Tony. Did you see the clip? Oh, of that? you watched that? I didn't watch oh. it. I saw a clip on Twitter and I reposted it, and I felt disgusting <laughs> reposting it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. that's how I feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is dying over here. Don't go dying on me now. We have a lot to get to. Fight season is here, and look at this run that we're on. Shakur De Los Santos this Thursday on on ESPN. <laughs> It's a great doubleheader. We'll get into that, too. Could say so as well. Benavidez, Andrade. We also have uh, Chantel Cameron versus Katie Taylor, too. Ryan Garcia versus Oscar Duarte. Haney, Progray. Bam, Sonny Edwards. In a way, Tapalas. And then this heavyweight mega card in Saudi Arabia with Joshua Wilder, uh, some of the bigger heavyweights on there, uh, you know, potentially Dimitri Bivol. So there's a lot happening in the next six weeks, right up until uh, New Year's Eve, um, where they have their big card over in Japan too. So there's a lot going on in the boxing world. Um, I'm ready for fight season. Are you ready, Chris? Hell yeah, I'm ready. You know I'm ready. Man, I'm... Look at me. You know I'm ready. Look at the guy that's ready. Haircut. About to get a haircut. I'll be extra ready. Looks like you just ready. got a haircut. Nah, this is how it grows in. Okay. Uh, of all the fights on Fight Season, which one are you most looking forward to? Oh, Boo Boo and, and uh, Benny Benavidez. By, by far. That's that's my number one. Um, after that, listen, I love my man Bam. I think he's in for he's in he's in a tough matchup. So that's that's a good one too. Whenever Inouye fights, I'm excited. I know I know my our man Ronnie back there is excited. Whenever Ronnie Inoue is here. Fights, I, I can't the monster. wait to see i know you i know you're, you're getting up 6 a.m on the six, day after christmas 6 a.m i know you get up at 6 a.m on christmas still yeah i do get your toys yep because i'm that young december yep. 26th in a way to polis in a way going for undisputed again in one dude in one, I, one I love these hol- holiday weekend fights i'm not gonna lie i, I, I feel like it's somewhat new like it, it doesn't happen that often we're getting it we're getting saturday saturday night after thanksgiving mm-hmm. which is Benavidez Boo Boo, which is the fight that I think is the best one of the year. And then the day after Christmas, we've got in a way fighting Tapales, which is a, an important fight and a potentially good fight. I mean, yeah, I'm, I, I like that, man. I'm going to be in my PJs, hopefully got my belly full of turkey watching Boo Boo and, and, and Benavidez go at it. And then Christmas Day, I'm going to be around all the presents I didn't get because you're a bad I mean, man. Ronnie, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an old bad man and there'll be a lot of coal around Lots me. Lots of coal, huh? Lots of coal. Lots of coal. And then um, also December 23rd, this mega card. Let's start here. Um, Quote, unquote, s- mega card. Mega card. December 23rd, Saudi Arabia uh, is hell-bent on putting on another big fight card. This was supposed to be the Usyk Fury fight, but they said, rest assured, we will still put on something big. And there were rumors trickling out, and there's still rumors trickling out as we speak. But over the weekend, we heard that Anthony Joshua will be part of this card. Deontay Wilder. Will be part of this card. Wow, they're actually going to fight each other finally for the first time. They've been talking since 2017. No, separate bouts. Joshua versus Otto Valin. Deontay Wilder versus Joseph Parker. Fine fights if this was 2017. Fine fights if this was 2018. It's it's fine, but it's 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 just another kind of slap in the face to boxing fans, Chris. I mean, would these have been good fights a couple of years? I don't think so. I, I, these are fights that nobody wants, but. Anthony Joshua and Deontay Wilder are fighting. So I'm happy about that. Um, Joseph Parker, listen, I, I like Joseph Parker. I like Otto Van Lien. They're very they're cool guys. They're 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 tough. They're they're they belong in the mix with 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 these guys, but I don't know. I don't think that those are really fights that are gonna get people super excited. Having them both on the same card with the the thought in mind that they're going to face each other next, yeah, that's exciting. The you know, but other than that, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how how exciting these matchups truly are now or ever have been. Well, I, I would optimistic Dan would say like, yeah, this probably means they're going to fight each other. This is how they used to do it in the early nineties. They put, you know, yeah. stack these cards, Don King cards. They would put Holyfield Tyson on a card or, or some other ones and they would fight the next year, but not, 
I'm not so sure about that with with Wilder talking about MMA and, and Francis Ngannou in the mix and Joshua and uh, why haven't Wilder and Joshua fought yet? You know, how come they can't get the fight on this card? Why are they going to uh, have to fight on separate fights on on, on this one? I mean, Valin coming off of the Fury win, um, excuse me, the Fury loss would have been a, a perfectly fine fight for Joshua and Parker three, four years ago would have been perfectly fine for Wilder too. It's just like fans are ready for Joshua Wilder now. It doesn't need any more marination. If anything, it's over marinated, but this is a ridiculously stacked card in terms of names, like something we've never seen before and only Saudi Arabia can pull off because they don't care about losses uh, when it comes to finances. Dimitri Bivol versus Popeye uh, Rivera from, from Star Boxing is the strangest oh, wow. fight ever. Like, what? Okay. What is that fight? Philip Hergovic, um, Daniel Dubois versus Jarrell Miller, Frank Sanchez versus Junior Fa. I mean, that's just as of today. This is like the full card, December 23rd. I don't hate it. I also I don't, don't love it. But it's just like I, I think it's just kind of offensive to, to fight fans where the, we'll watch literally anything. But you know, just give us Joshua Wilder. Why Why are we doing – if you, you guys can agree to fight the same card and there's enough money for that, you can't figure out a way to get them all to fight each other? Well, no, I'm sure they can. Um, and this is they're kind of slow playing it, and they're putting they're putting this massive. Listen, let's see if this happens. And we're we're talking like this is like a, like a done deal. I mean, I would I don't know. I, I always I always say I'm always I'm always cautious about these kinds of cards. It's a lot of money. Um, like you said, these guys don't care about losses, but they also don't care that much about the sport. Actually, they don't care about the sport at all. I'm actually um, more they, confident in Saudi making fights than anyone in the boxing right now. <laughs> That's a bad sign. They have That's so much money sign. to throw around. Yeah, but they don't care about the sport. So they could literally, and the, like you said, they don't care about losses. So they can cut this whole card right before. Who cares? They don't care. It's um, interesting. Another reason why it's interesting, Chris, is like there's like today, Eddie Hearn was with Joshua with the Turkish, uh, not Turk, with the uh, Saudi prince, and, and they were uh, taking a photo op there. You have. Um, Warren is talking as if he's the lead promoter in this. Uh, you have Fury, but not Fury, not involved with this. But you also have Bob Arum involved with. It. There's a lot of different promoters. Like, how's that all going to come together? Too. I guess money can solve a lot of things, and you can make a lot of people happy, especially um, promoters who have the biggest egos in the world. But like, who's the promoter of note here? It's just so many questions, and it's very odd. Yeah, uh, I mean, hopefully they pull it off, and hopefully this becomes a regular thing. We get these guys paid. Um, and they make these fights. I mean, it'll be a fun card. I mean, I, I, I would, I'm interested in every single one of those fights. As much as I don't love any of them, I'm curious to see all of them. I mean, Bivol, I'm happy that he's back. Um, Ergovic is, is a, one of the best heavyweights around. I, I want to, I really want to see him in tussle with the top guys. Obviously, he's not in with one, um, on this show, but listen, he's, he's getting, he's getting close to there. He's still early to the scene. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's it's. I always want to see Deontay. I love Deontay Wilder. I love when he fights. I mean, the Bomb Squad, all of it. I love it. And Anthony Joshua, he's one of my favorite heavyweights. So I love watching him fight as well. So I'm not super psyched about any one particular matchup, but I'm I'm curious and I'm looking forward to watching all those fights. Happy for for Otto if he gets this fight with Joshua. It's been kind of rumored to get that yeah. one for a long time. Uh, he's coming off that huge win of of Agassiev. I think he could be tricky. I think he could give uh, Joshua some issues. Uh, Joshua's still trying to find himself after all these years and. Um, Obviously wants the big fight, whether it's Ngano, whether it's Wilder, whether it's uh, Fury. You know, Valin is tough. Like, Valin, that, that's that's not an easy night uh, for, for any fighter. And with Parker, too, he's just like a grizzled vet. Obviously mm -hmm. has some losses and, and took an absolute beating uh, from the juggernaut. So he's, his best days are behind him. But he can easily go in there and, and, and kind of dance around Wilder and, and win rounds if Wilder's not sharp. I mean, Wilder hasn't fought, has fought one round in the last, like, three years. But... It's interesting. You're right. Like, there's not one fight that I'm like, oh, I have to see it. But I'm like the the sum of it, like the total the totality of this card, and it being on December 23rd is kind of intriguing. And this is something that boxing fans are going to have to get used to now. Saudi Arabia is putting on these big fight cards. It's, they're trying to be the capital of the boxing world. So you think is that a there, Saturday or a Sunday? 23rd. Let me pull up my calendar here. Ronnie is on it. Super producer. December 23rd is a Saturday. Okay. Saturday right, afternoon. So, so Christmas is on a Monday? Christmas Eve Eve. Saudi Arabia. The Joshua. Eve of the Eve. The Eve of the Eve. I, I think it's going to happen. I saw Joshua there today. Um, We'll see. Uh, If it leads to Joshua Wilder, so be it. I'm not that convinced it does because of all the moving parts in the heavyweight division, but that's one of the bigger stories in the boxing world right now. Another big story, Chris. 
IBF strips Terrence Crawford. Jerron Boots elevated to full champ. This is boxing politics. This is boxing. Can't get out of its own way. The decision was rooted in the fact that Crawford couldn't fulfill his mandatory, which is Jerron Ennis, due to his contractual obligation to fight Spence in the rematch. So the IBF knew damn well that they couldn't order Spence versus Ennis because, uh, excuse me, uh, Crawford versus Ennis because there's a Spence rematch. And it didn't matter. They still strip Terrence Crawford just four or five months after beating Errol Spence. What a joke. This is bullshit on so many levels. I mean, every, in every way, this is bullshit. You got Jamal Charlo, who doesn't fight for 28 months, holds on to his belt. You got Tyson Fury fighting in basically other sports, holds on to his belt. Can- Can- Canelo's never been stripped of anything. He can do whatever he wants. He jump up in weight class, go back down, go in and out. It doesn't matter. Terrence Crawford is the pound for pound best fighter in the world. He hasn't had the belt for six months. And they're they're stripping him off of a proposed other fight. It's just it's just greed and it's stupid and it's the fact that it's there's no one rule. No rule. Everyone has a different rule. That's the problem. Listen, actually, it what they're doing is not is not wrong. The problem is that they don't do it to everyone. And if they're going to do it to the top guy, what are you, what are we doing? Right. What is this? It, it's a madhouse. Absolutely. I mean, this is it's it, it's just, this is I mean, it's clown court here. I don't understand what these guys. And actually, I do understand. It's all greed. All these governing bodies are a scourge on the sport. And this stuff just pisses me off. It really does. It's like greed, incompetence, uh, making rules up as you go along, all the above. But also they don't care. That's what really pisses me off. They do this stuff without caring because there's no repercussions. Nobody cares. No one's going to fight them. No, there is no there's no one higher to come down on them. That's why they do whatever they want. And it's disgusting. It hurts the sport. Absolutely hurts the sport. The IBF doesn't acknowledge rematch clauses as an exception. The thing that really just proves your whole point there is Spence was the IBF champ for how long? Like like five, six years? How many uh, mandatory defenses was was he given over a six-year span? Terrence Crawford. I mean, excuse me, Errol Spence. One. I, one. Carlos exactly. Ocampo in 2018. Yeah, so they fight that. So Stop. obviously, <laughs> yeah. So obviously, Spence had a lot of injuries during that time, and the IBF president came out and said, "Oh, we probably should have stripped him, or we probably should have gave him another mandatory in there." But uh, we didn't realize how long he was going to be out. So th- that's what I mean. That's like what you just said. That's like they play by their own rules. They make up the rules as they go along. Like the IBF has their own rules. The WBC uh, lets their fighters get away with everything. Don't get me started on the WBA. They're the most blatantly corrupt organization of them all. And they have the WBO, which is, I mean, they all have their separate rules. It just doesn't look good for the sport. Like someone like Ronnie, who's just following along, knows that Terrence Crawford is the man right now, and you're gonna go and take a, a title away from him, coming off of one of the biggest wins of the year, and elevate a guy in, in, in Ennis. And it doesn't make Ennis feel great either, because no. he's getting his belt via email, just like Haney did, and just like some of the other guys that got elevated to, to full champ. I'm sure Ennis played the game, and um, I'm sure he's not that excited to get his title this way. Like he wanted to win it in the ring like you did, Chris. He wants to win it, the, his title in the ring. Not, hey, you've just been elevated. Now you have to deal with everyone chirping at you. Like You can't get a fight with Crawford, and now you have to get elevated from a, a technicality. It's ridiculous. I didn't even get to, to talk about Ennis because I was so hot-headed about the, the governing bodies and what they're doing here with, with Crawford. But yeah, absolutely. I, I feel for the kid because, first of all, he deserves to be world champion, but he deserves a fight for a title. There should be no email champions. This that that is I don't, I don't know where the hell that came from. If you're an interim champion, you got to fight to get to, to, to right. then become elevated to full champion. This whole email champion thing is such well, That's another thing IBF doesn't shit. believe in, Chris, not to cut you off. They don't do interim titles. Like There should be two guys fighting for the interim title. Okay, they they don't believe in interim titles, but they believe in email champions. They, they you just you just get a belt. Yeah, it's it again. It's greed. It's so they can get a, a, a sanction fee on mm-hmm. on his next fight. That's all it is. That's all it is, and it's ridiculous because Ennis doesn't want to be a, 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 a get his title this way. Like you said, he wants to fight, and he it, it's it's pushing the the fans to have this ire against him that he's going to have to deal with now, and that sucks as a as a fighter. He's yeah. going to have to deal with this, and he's going to have that 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 monkey on his back of being like. I I gotta I gotta fight I gotta fight somebody now and you know these guys are on my back no matter what for months at a time while I'm training I I, I hate all of it stinks I don't think that um you need a sanctioning body to tell you who's the best welterweight in the world no. Terrence Crawford is the best welterweight so if one thing one positive you can gain from this is that take those those sanctioning bodies take those belts I know they mean something in theory. 
Let's just chuck him because the best welterweight right now is Terrence Crawford. I, I, I think that that's just very clear. But it, you have to deal as a boxing fan. You have to deal with a lot of crap. You have to deal with a lot of games played by these sanctioned bodies, the IBF, uh, this week. Uh, after Fury Nusik fight, the same thing's going to happen there. They're going to strip the IBF will strip uh, the winner there and give it award to Hergovic. They already said they're going to do that too. So it's just out of control, man. It's it's so bad for the sport. It's so confusing. Um, but I don't know what this means in, in terms of Crawford. I think it kind of tips his hand that potentially um, the Spence fight is going to happen sometime in, in early January, and it could be at one one fifty four. But it's just kind of it's just it's Terrence Crawford is the undisputed champ, but he doesn't get a defensive. That's why undisputed too. Something you've talked about too, Chris. It's like. Not all undisputed are created equal. Um, you're undisputed for such a short amount of time. It's a, it's pretty much just like a little title to have after one win, and then all of a sudden the, these sanctioned bodies come out of the woodworks and either want your money or want you to fight these these fights that just don't make sense for Crawford right now. Yeah, I mean, I understand champions if they, if they to win their titles and be like, all right, I'm 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 the undisputed, like you said. Everyone knows I'm the best in the world. I'm dropping every belt because I don't want to pay the sanctioned fees next fight. I don't want to pay that percentage off of each, and you have to pay each one of them. If you buy, you got all four belts, 12%. you got to pay four sanction fees. You got to pay four sanction fees. That's insane. So, yeah, yeah th- th- there's that. Um, you, you mentioned a good point about this potentially tips their hand or their hat that we are going to see the Crawford Spence. Maybe maybe the IBF knows something that we don't in terms of how far along um, it, or how close we are to actually having that fight happen. And obviously, it's not going to happen at 47 because there's going to be no defense of that title. Um, yeah. So likely the fight will be at 54 likely the fight is happening like we've all thought um but this could just kind of give us an idea that that inside knowledge that's what's going on behind the scenes yeah it's pretty clear um good point there so i guess one one little thing to take from it uh but it's just more nonsense and in, in boxing for, for, for boxing fans to try to keep up with but Ennis is now the champ at IBF champ at 147. He says he wants to fight Mario Barrios. Um, I think a good fight for Ennis would be uh, the proposed fight between uh, Thurman and Stanley Onis. Um, it's good for, for Ennis. Obviously, it, it, it gets him. Uh, he's a champ, and we talked about that's not the way he wanted to be a champ. But if you can get his career kind of moving a little bit, because, man, it's one of the most mismanaged careers. It's one of the most frustrating things. But, you know, get it moving at 147. If Spence and Crawford can move up to 154, let's get Ennis in there with Stanionis. Let's get Ennis in there whatever's left of Thurman. Uh, Barrios is a decent fight. I expect Ennis to win all those fights and then figure it out from there. Who's the next guys? Who are the next guys at 147? Because uh, I think Ennis can rule that. I think he can become the next undisputed. If he wants to, because I think maybe this could leave a sour taste in his mouth. You know, becoming undisputed, I feel like it's the goal for every fighter. Or is it? I should ask you, Chris. Is it the goal, or just become a world champion? Yeah, but like you mentioned, the belts and like getting rid of the belts matter. They still matter. I got mine right, right up there. So belts, belts still matter. I cherish my belt. Um, I don't cherish the organizations, but uh, again, I, I cherish winning my title, and I think every champion does. And also, it allows you to step into a, a an elite class of fighter for history. You're you're allowed now into that fraternity of being a world champion. So having a belt, winning a world title, really does matter. Um, being undisputed is a whole different thing. And it's kind of a new thing, especially in the four belt era. And we're seeing much more of those happen, but listen, you know what, you know what we really care about being the baddest motherfucker on the planet. And if, if Ennis goes out there and he starts beating everybody up, which I actually, I think he will, I think he's going to rule 147 and he can collect all the belts. Um, that's really what matters. Just like we said about Terrence Crawford. Yeah. He's getting stripped of the IBA title, but it doesn't matter. He's still the best fighter in the world. He's the best welterweight in the world by far. And he's most people have him as the best pound for pound fighter in the world as well. That matters more than anything. If you look into the tip top, that's what you want to be. All right. Let's move on to this weekend. Or should I say this week, Thursday night, ESPN, regular ESPN over at T-Mobile, uh, 10.30 Eastern. We're going to have a doubleheader brought to you by Top Rank with Shakur Stevenson and Edwin De Los Santos in the main event for Stevenson. It's his second fight at 135 pounds, Chris. It's a chance to become a three-division world champ in just a nine-fight span uh, for Stevenson. I mean, the kid's now 26 years old, which kind of took me by surprise. I thought he was a little bit younger. Uh, but he's coming into his his physical prime i feel like he's also coming into his uh mental prime um he's a minus 1200 favorite uh do we expect edwin de los santos to put up much of resistance or is this going to be another shakur stevenson master class on thursday night well i see i see it one of two ways i see um i could see places where edwin could really be difficult 
and De Los Santos could really um, push Shakur to a place we've never seen him before and have to see him really dig down and show the true class that he has. Um, but I could also see Shakur doing what he does and completely out- outclassing and schooling Edwin De Los Santos and, and winning a shutout. I don't see I don't see Shakur uh, stopping him. I see it going to decision. Um, I do think that De Los Santos is going to push him a little bit at times, but I, I, I don't think it's going to be a particularly close fight. Mm-hmm. I think Shakur, once he figures him out, he starts to control the puncher, making him miss, making him pay, um, touching that body. I, I think that um, he's going to show that he is the class and he's going to be that for a long time. When you say push Shakur Stevenson, like what are we saying there? Like, like outland him, uh, you know, physically. Uh, how about land? Land some punches <laughs> because, <laughs> because the kid doesn't get hit. How about this? At 133 professional rounds, of course, Stevenson has been outlanded in terms of total punches only three times. Three rounds in 133 professional rounds. Round seven against Joet Gonzalez, round three against Oscar Valdez, and round one against Kinsaysau. He has not been outlanded in each of his last 17 rounds. Like, that's insane. I- it's insane. It's insane. And that, but that's why that's why we talk about him so highly. He not only does it, you know, object uh, uh, subjectively as we're watching, he does it objectively on, on the numbers, like things like that. I mean, the kid is that good. And I, but De Los Santos is a very dangerous guy. And and I broke this down on on Pro Box. We were talking about what De, Lo, De Los Santos does well, and he punches with you. Mm. The problem is that Shakur likes to control the position when he does decide to punch he's not a big volume guy he's not going to sit there and trade punches with you um and he picks his spots really well he makes sure his opponent's off balance so he doesn't have an opportunity to counter um De Sotos isn't so much a counter puncher but he punches in the middle he doesn't mind trading a shot to land because he believes in his power but if you can do that with your core you know he's got a shot but he's one of the most difficult guys to get into a, a dog fight with and i don't i don't foresee him doing that but i do foresee De Los santos because of his He's rugged because his ruggedness, but also his mentality. Have you been watching the, uh, the, the, the clips that top rank has been putting out about yeah. the workouts, dude, this guy's coming to fight and he's not the kind of guy who's going who's to be beaten before he steps in the ring because he's fighting off oh, Shakur Stevenson. You can't hit the guys this good. He's this virtuoso young fighter, the great champion. I don't see that in him. He's, you know, he's going to go out there. He's going to be rugged. He's going to be rough. Um, he's there to win. Uh, I think it's going to be really tough to get him to, to tuck his tail and, and run like some other guys might. So that's where I think that that the push is going to come from when it comes to De Los Santos. Yeah, De Los Santos is an interesting uh, fighter here and an interesting assignment because you know this was not supposed to be De, De Los Santos. This was supposed to be Lomachenko, and Lomachenko turned down the fight. This was supposed to be Frank Martin. Frank Martin famously turned down the fight. De Los Santos is the sixth-ranked uh, fighter in the WBC right now, but he's the top-ranked guy for Stevenson by a process of what we just said there, fighters not wanting to take this fight. He had that win over Jose Venezuela where he just steamrolled him, right? It was a marginal upset September twenty of 2022. Then he boxed circles around Adorno in, in July. I remember betting on that That was fight. impressive. Right, and I was like, all right, this is a clear De Los Santos knockout. He's going to knock out Adorno. But then he goes in there and he's boxing. He's in and out, in and out. And I'm like, okay, who is Evan De Los Santos at this moment? So is he a brawler? Or is he a boxer? And how are you going to use that against Stevenson? Because if he attacks Stevenson, if he is is very aggressive, like he was against Venezuela, he's going to get picked apart left and right because Stevenson's one of the most accurate punchers in boxing. If he stands on the outside, he's going to let Stevenson dictate the distance and Stevenson will pick him apart there. Is it like a hybrid? We haven't seen a way to disrupt Stevenson. We only have he's only been out in it three times at 133 rounds. Is Diego Santos going to use both of those performances, his last two performances, and try to box? I don't know, box or punch? Or I, I don't even know how you attack Shakur Stevenson. Well, therein lies the rub, man. That's that's what Shakur is so difficult to deal with because listen, yeah, you're, you're not going to outbox him. And, and De Los Santos is shown to be not only a, a boxer, he can box, he can brawl, um, he can punch, he can counter punch, he's got good distance control, but you're not going to outbox Shakur Stevenson. And if you brawl with him, he's, you're going to get picked apart. So how do you offset him? You've got to get him out of his comfort zone. You've got to be able to touch him in places that he's not used to getting touched. Bang his shoulders, bang his hips, bang his elbows. I think De Los Santos hits hard enough that he could get some respect that way, being physical that way. Also, show zero respect. 
If, mm. if, if Shakur hits you with something that you don't really, war- it doesn't not bothers you walk right through that shit. Keep throwing punches, punch with him. I, I think that's the Santos' best, best chance is to use his power uh, to show a complete lack of respect for Shakur. And I mean, but De Los Santos has been hurt too. He's, he's been, been down. Hurt. He's been down. He's been hurt. He's been down. So I, I, it's a very dangerous game to not show a guy like Shakur respect. I'm not saying Shakur is a puncher by any means, but he's not a bad puncher. He's physically strong enough. So he's got to be tough enough and willing to disrespect Shakur and his power, but also get through that fire in order to, to, to be physical, to punch wherever he can and to try and punch with Shakur basically just make him uncomfortable, make him fight outside of what he does. Cause when he's in control, that means he's got his opponent under control and you ain't, you ain't hitting nothing but air. Yeah. Shakur is in control. Um, you, you mentioned Shakur not being a, a big puncher and he's got a modest knockout uh, per percentage. But the thing with him is he's so precise, you know, like mm-hmm. in that Herring fight, it's when it really stuck out to me. Like you know, he was landing at will. Um, yeah, yeah, also against that was a whole different guy. Right. I mean, so he, they were sparring partners. He knew he knew that Herring was a little shot. He knew he, he knew he had nothing for him. He just if you know, I watched that fight the other day. He just walked him down and beat him up. Right. But uh, it, that's not the way, that's not the way Shakur fights. No. But that, my point being is like he he, he doesn't hit, have one punch power, but he'll he'll accumulate and with range and he'll accumulate with 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 uh, accuracy. Forty seven percent. Uh, which is number two behind Tank Davis in, in, in all of boxing. That's Shakur Stevenson. My final stat, my favorite stat on uh, Shakur. Where is it? I have it right here. Stevenson enters the fight with a plus 20.3 plus minus rating. Only two fighters entered the ring with an above plus 20 plus minus rating. Floyd Mayweather and Vasily Lomachenko. So those are the, those are the, the, the type of company that Shakur has right now. I think it's a big moment for him. I think he has had a pretty tumultuous um, road to this fight. Um, there was all the, the stuff with the Haney offer of 25%. He kind of got clowned for that. He's getting a lot of heat on social media from, from boxing fans, uh, the Frank Martin stuff, the Lomachenko stuff. I think this is going to be a, a, a chance for for Shakur once again to show who he is and make a statement uh, and win a belt at, one, at 135 you know, win a belt at 135, become a three division world champion uh, at age 26, and set his sights on some really big fights at 135. This is the first step in the second chapter of Shakur Stevenson's career. 100. percent I mean, this is this is a three division world champion. You're entering an elite class of fighter. Uh, this is a historic moment for for Shakur, and and it's it's going to open the doors for the rest of his career. I talked about this guy. I talk about this all the time. I think he's a generational talent. I think we're going to see him at 140, 147. And some of his best fights are going to be in the 40s, I believe. Um, the, the, the kid is that good. He's got the goods, um, both inside the ring and out. And um, this is just another step in in, in his career. But, um, I mean, every time this guy fights, I'm excited because I, I like what I'm watching. I know a lot of people, may, maybe casual fans or whatnot, they don't, like the, they don't love the guy who is the – not necessarily safety first, but defense first kind of guy. Uh, but listen, I love a technician and the kid is super technical. His boxing IQ is through the roof. Um, I like to see that. You got to be able to analyze. You got to be able to watch a guy like Shakur with, with a, with a sharp eye, with a keen intellect, mm. because you got to watch what's going on. It's very, boxing is such a nuanced sport and Shakur does it better than almost anybody in the world today. So all you fans who are, who are watching on, uh, on Thursday, make sure you're watching everything that young man's doing from, from his top of his head to the bottom of his feet, things are going on. He's doing things uh, on purpose. I think there's a the fans are a little more keen to that. I think they're a little yeah. more schooled to what Shakur does so well in there. I think Top Rank's doing a really good job. Uh, I think Shakur is doing a really good job of getting his name. Our out fans there. certainly are. If you tune into this show, you've got a very good keen boxing eye and and ear. So I'm sure anybody who listens to this and watches Shakur knows what's going on. Yeah, they know what's up. Yeah, I, I think Shakur's ready for the next step. He's ready for the the bigger fights. I don't know what's going to come of this afterwards. Um, do I think he'll get Tank in the ring next year? Probably not. Uh, Haney, probably not either. But there are other good names out there. Other good names out there on this card in the co-main event: Emmanuel Navarrete taking on Robson uh, Conceição. You know Conceição. He's this his third uh, title shot in his last five fights. I don't know how he keeps getting these title shots, but for Navarrete, 
You're talking about a guy from 2019 to 2020 made five defenses of his featherweight title. He slowed down a little bit, but he remains one of the most action-packed fighters that you can possibly put on television right now, fan-friendly. And I think in his last fight over Valdez is when he really cemented his status. He became a three-division world champion. He was looking for that signature win, Navarrete, and he got it over Valdez, and he, he looked he was nearly flawless in, in that fight. I mean... Uh, you know, Valdez could not get inside on, on Navarrete, and I thought he finally put everything together. I think Navarrete kind of got past that whole thing where it's like, all right, look at this guy. He fights like a, like a like a madman. He throws punches from angles you wouldn't teach. Will it last? He he can't make the weight. I think that all went out the window, and I think now he's entering like, all right, this guy's legit. Let's look at him as a serious fighter. Could he potentially go to 135 and take on Shakur? I'm interested in watching Navarrete in this uh, co-main event. Yeah, I, I, I've I've known about Navarrete in terms of being legit for a while now. I've called a bunch of his types, his fights for uh, top rank international. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with you. With the Oscar Valdez win, it's an it's a win over another Mexican champion. I think that really solidified his status with the Mexican fan base, which is gigantic, which is huge. Um, and you talked about three division world champion entering that elite class. Every time he fights, everybody should tune in because it's fun. No matter what, it's fun. And can say Sal talk about another technician. I mean, he is another super talented technical guy, really big for the weight class. He's tall. He's long. He boxes really well. He's got a huge amateur pedigree. This is an interesting fight. I like it. When I first heard about it, I was like, huh, never really thought about these guys in the ring together. And they've such, it's such a clash of styles that those always make for interesting thought processes, th thought processes for me. Cause I'm thinking about how are these guys going to match up physically, technically, strategically, so I think this fight may be a lot more interesting than than people are giving it credit for. Really thinking about it, um, I think it's a good opener. I think I think it's another it's another two name guys in the yeah. weight class. So um, shit, I'm, I like the card. It's a good card, even on a Thursday. Yeah, on Thursday, that's a great thing. That's not, it's going up against football, which is not great. And people are using that as a slight <laughs> against Shakur. It's like, man, you're fighting on a Thursday. Tank fights on Saturdays, and so I'm like, what does it matter? Like this one, like Saturday night. Now you can go out and do something because Thursday night you can watch boxing, but. That's a story for another day. I actually think Navarrete can get a stoppage here. I think Kinsaysa, uh has been beat, obviously. He's got a couple losses. Um, I think Navarrete, like I said, is coming into his own. He's going to throw a lot of punches, 72 per round to be exact. 80% of his Navarrete's landed punches are power shots, does not care about the jab. I'm just wondering how Kinsaysa keeps getting these these shots. You know, like I think a guy like Albert Bell, who's on the top-ranked <laughs> roster, I think is way more deserving for this. But that's just like the WBO. That, that's just kind of like top rank. Is like they, they keep kind of like recycling some of these guys. Third title shot in his last five fights for, for Kinsasa. Like I've seen him in the ring. And like you're right, Chris. He is very talented. He is very skilled. There's no doubt about that. But I, I just know that he's not going to get into that second gear. I know he's not going to be able to hang with Navarrete from a power standpoint. Maybe he lasts uh, to the 12th round. But I just don't see Kinsasa getting his hand raised at the end of this fight. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the power, the pressure, uh, the pace that's set by Navarrete, is, it, it's breakneck speed, and he's all over you, and he's got such long arms, he can hit you and hurt you from far away. That lead uppercut he throws, the thing is silly. It comes from it comes from yesterday and hits guys on their chin and and, and, and it has power. It doesn't, they don't look like hard shots, and they just... It's he's he generates a tremendous amount of power from awkward angles and weird places. Um, so yeah, and he throws a lot of punches and he's and he's very aggressive. So it's gonna be curious to see how a, tech, a technical guy like Kinsaysa can deal with him. Um, but I agree with you. I, I don't see him really being able to contend with Navarrete, especially down the stretch. Um, but either way, I mean, again, I want to I want to see how these guys attack each other strategically to try and win. You think Navarrete can get a knockout win? I think that would be the. The, val the the bet here, or if I do a parlay, I have to do a parlay. I think I haven't done one in a while. Um, I'm thinking that Navarrete wants to make another statement, wants to um, jump up to 135. We can talk about that quick before we get into the parlay. Like Navarrete, do you think he can? his style and his power can translate to 135? Because you look around at 130, and there's Hector Luis Garcia, there's Oshaki Foster, there's Joe Cordina. Good names, but those aren't like at the stage that Navarrete's in. Uh, the small window you have as a as a fighter to make the most dollars, the the money fight for him is is Shakur Stevenson. So, do you think Navarrete can hop, finally hop up to one thirty five, and do you think he be be competitive with the likes of of Shakur? No. Why is that? Simple answer. No, I don't think so. It's good looking at his fourth weight class. Um, even even at thirty, he's starting to look human. 
at 22 and 26, I mean, he, he was just such a monster. And, but even at 30, I mean, um, he fought the, uh, who was it? Uh, was it Wilson? Liam, yeah. Who, Liam Wilson. Who? Liam Wilson. Yeah. Hurt Rocked him with the left hook. Dropped him. 27 him seconds. Hook. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he looked human there. And I think but going that's, that's kind of like class, the beauty of Navarrete though. It's like, yeah, I, but, I but, just, no, but he, never, about... he didn't look human at 26 at 26 and 22. He was a freak yeah. and he was so strong and no one could hurt him. No one could do anything. He was, he was beating guys up, blowing them out. Then at 30, he became human and the fights got competitive. They're fun. They're really fun. They're getting funner. Uh, I think at 35, I think is where he, he oversteps his bounds. Those guys at 35 are big. Um, but they're putting know, they're there, putting but... him on this card for a reason. Like I, I believe that they're you know it's getting harder and harder to find a dance partner for Stevenson. Navarrete is a fighter that pretty much all boxing fans know at this point. He's been flirting with going up to 135. He, he's had trouble making the weight, uh, 130 or 126. You know 135 seems like a natural spot for him. Not saying he's going to beat Stevenson by any means, but let's say that would be a fun one. Stevenson versus uh, Navarrete. You know, f- spring of 2024. It... It's going to happen. Right. That's why this. That's why they're they're setting this up. And Stevenson will get another name on his belt, he, uh, under under his belt, and on his record. And he'll have a three division world champion, the guy to to tune up. Uh, Tevin Farmer came out and said, like, ah, never that these easy work. He's slow. And yeah, I mean that's a bold statement for 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 Tevin, but he's not wrong. <laughs> so you put him in with Shakur. Yeah, Shakur's going to see all those shots coming from a mile away. He's not going to get touched. Um, it's just yeah. And plus Shakur's got the size size advantage. Um, but yeah, we're probably going to see that fight, and I don't see that being competitive at all. All right, that's the fights this weekend. I got to put together my uh, parlay. I kind of like Navarrete uh, to win by. They don't have it up yet on DraftKings, but they will. Navarrete by stoppage. <laughs> Stevenson is such a big uh, favorite; he's minus twelve hundred. So I don't know, like over. Like I don't see Stevenson stopping De Los Santos. No, I think that goes the distance. Like, do you think Stevenson, like, do you think he thinks about that? Do you think he's like, all right, I need, like, a, an exclamation point? Or is he kind of like Haney in a way where Haney will just win by any means necessary? Like, he doesn't care if it's not pretty. I feel like Stevenson um, could use a big knockout, but it might not just be in his DNA. Because I've heard you tell me that numerous times. You know, to be a finisher, it's got to be in your DNA. Yeah, I think he's more, you mentioned Haney, I think he's more like Floyd in terms of the way that he goes about with his wins. Um, you know, he can... He can do it. He can take less. He takes less damage. I think Haney has to fight harder, even though even though he's he's uh, more of a points guy and he doesn't mm-hmm. care how he wins. I think he has to tr- he has to try a lot harder than a guy like than Shakur does or a guy like Floyd did. So I think stylistically, um, I think Shakur likes to stay in his own pocket and he takes the same in the driver's seat. Like, like I always talk about control with him. He controls his opponent. He's able to disarm them, control them, put them where he wants them to be waits till they're in a position where they're uncomfortable and can't really punch or respond and then fire. He takes his, he takes the risk out of a risky sport. Uh, similar to the way Floyd did. Haney fights pretty risky at times. He, he, he and I think he has to based on um, he, he's not, he's a different fighter than Shakur, a different fighter than, than Floyd. His pace is higher. He's got to be faster. He's got to be quicker. He's got to use his speed. Uh, more than just IQ, so I would I would liken him much more to Floyd than than, than Haney, but no, I don't think he cares. Right. Win is a win is a win. It is a win on, is a win. Get win is a win is a win. Move I don't on, know if get, I'm, the, get the belt, move, move past it. Right. I don't know if I'm comfortable having Haney uh, Shakur stoppage. Um, you know he had one in his, in his last fight, but you know uh, Yoshino is is not De Los Santos. I think De Los yeah. Santos is going to be game. Um, I think Navarrete is going to look great Thursday night boxing. I'm all for it. Like, this is fun to me. It's something different. We'll watch. We'll react. Uh, Thursday night, we'll have a, a post-fight show. Chris, you won't be a part of it. I'm sorry, everybody yeah. out there. Chris, have, you have a busy week, man. You're a busy man. Tell us about your, your upcoming uh, itinerary. Yes, yeah, so we got Pro Box coming up this week. So talk about having like off days fights, like Thursday night fight. We got Wednesday night fights on Pro Box every other week. Yeah. So I'm working, I'm working Wednesday night fight. Uh, then Thursday, I'm flying up to New York to go to Staten Island for the uh, the Teddy Atlas, Doctor Atlas Foundation mm. uh, annual annual dinner banquet. It's going to be myself and and Paulie Malignaggi and a bunch of other great historic champions. Our boy George Jakovic is going to be with us as well. Another Give Teddy Pro my regards, okay? I I will I will. He is okay. a now a contributor on Pro Box TV, so I get this I get to chat with him every week. Nice. Um, and then Friday morning, I fly out to LA to help host the, the, uh, the weigh in for the Pacheco fight with our boy, Justin Shackle. And then we're calling John boy media zone Saturday. We're everywhere, dude. All right. So pro box Wednesday, Teddy Atlas dinner Thursday. 
Correct. Saturday. And, uh, uh, match room match to zone. Room. That's a Pacheco yeah. card. Pacheco and Pacheco is Stuck. he has been my favorite prospect for a while. And I don't know, is like, he even a prospect now? He's kind of like uh, now he's a contender. We need a you word know, between like, prospect and contender. Like, yeah. what, what, and that's what is why that, word? that was my caveat to what yeah. I was saying. Like he was my favorite prospect for a while, rising but now star. he's really contender. Rising status. star says Ronnie. Rising star is a very good, a very good namesake moniker for. for do you have any Daniel tips Pacheco. for people that travel like that three days in a row? Like, what do you do for for fitness? What do you do for food? Mental uh, gin on the flights is really uh, helpful. Gin, on the gin, orange juice in the mornings, uh, gin and ginger ale in the afternoons. No, um, so just drink alcohol. I, I would say if you can sleep on flights, that really helps. I can't. Um, you know what I do? Yeah. I do the old like I'll fall asleep for like a second. I'll just jump up and like scare everyone in my row. <laughs> That's I never want to trap with you, buddy. That sounds terrible. I can't like um, go for more than oh, no, I'm not going to finish that sentence. So I, 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 I can't I last. Say, off the plane, time to train. As soon as you land, wherever you are, hit the gym. Get a workout and get a sweat in. It resets you. Get I you take ready. Take a nap. Have to hit the gym first. Hit the gym. Hit take the a nap. Go to first. dinner. Yeah. Chris Algieri way. The lifestyle. Fighters lifestyle. Life that Champion was, lifestyle. That Champion sounds lifestyle. pretty good. Ronnie, you watch any Rocky? No, I gotta watch Rocky. Rocky three. I gotta watch Rocky, but the fights have been too good. Fights have been too good. Rocky, you got to watch Rocky 3 because Rocky 4, we're having a, a, a having a little viewing here in the live stream lounge at John Boy. We're going to watch Rocky 4. Yes. Um, our accountant, Tony Capabianco, has an espresso machine at his desk. We're going to make espresso martinis after Yikes. hours and watch Rocky 4. I've never had nobody's, an espresso martini. Nobody's sleeping that night. <laughs> Those things will keep you. They're, they're good? They're very good, but if you have more than two, you're... You're I'm on not, another I planet. Don't plan, I don't plan on having more than Yeah, that. it's a weird, you, you get weirdly drunk. It's basically like, it's basically like a vodka Red Bull. Yeah, mm, it's, oh. new, it's like a classier ro- vodka Red I Bull. I had a lot of those in Vegas. <laughs> I had a lot of those in my college days. <laughs> All right, everyone, hope you have a great week. Uh, look for our uh, post-fight reaction on Thursday night. Look for Chris all over the continental USA. We'll be back next week to break it all down and preview Andrade versus Benavidez. On Thanksgiving weekend, fight season has begun, and the best place to watch it all is right here on Inside Boxing Live. Protect yourself at all times. Keep your hands up at all times. Stay out of those DMs unless you got gin for Chris Algieri. Goodbye.